And you are watching PBS Books. Hi, I'm Fred Nahat. Nice to have you along with us for our series of conversations in connection with the 2020 National Book Festival put on by Library of Congress each year. This year, of course, it happened virtually uh, online uh, a couple of weekends ago. And of course, it all culminated in a terrific uh, documentary. We want you to visit the Library of Congress, the YouTube page or the website for all of the sessions, all the author interviews that uh, happened throughout that well, that acclaimed anniversary weekend of this outstanding tradition in Washington, D.C., brought to you uh, by uh, Public Television, PBS Books, the Library of Congress virtually this year. Uh, we appreciate that all of the efforts um, with all of our stations in the theme, of course, this year, celebrating American ingenuity. And it all culminated in the two-hour documentary uh, that has been airing and will air at uh, PBS SoCal coming up October 15th uh, at 5 p.m., Examining the work of a, a diverse group of American authors hosted by Hoda Kotb of the Today Show and featuring uh, guests like Joy Harjo, Salman Rushdie, Madeleine Albright, John Grisham, and so many others. And today's uh, event is our latest in a series of conversations with uh, those talented authors and our chance to speak with the likes of uh, Pam Munoz Ryan, who will join us uh, coming up in just a couple of moments. But first, let me uh, welcome in uh, Heather Montilla, who is the Library Bureau Chief of PBS Books. Lots of excitement. It all continues coming out of the National Book Festival and the documentary. Uh, we're excited to be connected with our uh, friends at PBS SoCal this afternoon and evening. Yes, you know, um, Fred, this has been so very wonderful for all of us. And especially, I think, for us to be able to partner with the Library of Congress and share this experience with Americans across the country through our library engagement program of more than 1,700 libraries um, and, and partner with authors. We're so excited. They are the literary luminaries of our country. And as we celebrate American ingenuity, we've really been able to, to share that with every American. The, the Library Book Festival, um, the, the National Book Festival really focused on three primary areas. One was democracy in the 21st century. The other is hearing black voices and then also fearless women. And so together we've been able to experience those many of us by going online. But the good news is it's not too late. You can still go online today and still enjoy both the, the streaming experience of all of the amazing content of over 160 authors, as well as to watch the amazing PBS uh, special. Uh, and our interview with uh, Pam Munoz Ryan coming up, the book Manana Land. So our uh, live stream events uh, continue, uh, as well as our connection with stations across the country. Heather Montilla, thank you for your efforts, uh, as always. We'll uh, speak again soon. Let me now welcome in uh, uh, Maria Hall Brown, the host and senior producer, I would say, of LA Art, which is on PBS SoCal, uh, a well known personality uh, throughout LA. And Maria, it's great to see you, as always. And to have you uh, involved in this, and we're going to have you interview uh, 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 Pam Munoz Ryan, couldn't be better. I know. I am incredibly lucky, and I am so thrilled to be here with you guys today. And really, thank you for allowing me to be a part of such a, actually an ingenious thing. You're talking about the whole theme of ingenuity that we were able to be a part of not only celebrating the National Book Festival with the Library of Congress, but also share all of this with our great audiences, our great PBS audiences, and all of the other people who are joining us. Uh, I'm happy to welcome the Southern California community and all of the wonderful viewers nationwide. As I said, I'm really honored to be a part of this inside look into the thoughts of remarkable authors, and in particular, Pam Munoz Ryan, who we're gonna to talk to in a couple of minutes. I do wanna point out that we are going to be airing the two-hour documentary, which is the culmination of the Library of Congress Book Festival uh, on PBS SoCal on October uh, 15th at 5 p.m. We'll also uh, have the opportunity for all of our local Southern California uh, PBS fans, you can log on to pbssocal.org and you can stream it at any time. And if you're outside the Southern California market and you want to be able to mark, uh, watch this show, make sure that you you look at your PBS station because uh, different times uh, are when it's scheduled across the country. And you know, Fred, that Southern California loves their books. Oh, absolutely. And I was going to say, you and I have been doing this a long time. You covering art and culture in the mm -hmm. LA area, uh, the PBS content, the national series, the uh, local specials uh, and series as well. 
-hmm. a lot of it comes back down to the written word and oftentimes uh, starts out um, being inspired by a book or a series yeah. of books. You bet. I mean, obviously, I mean, we're in the entertainment capital of the world. And of course, you know, a lot of films are made, uh, you know, stem from the creative minds of authors, books made into film. But, you know, when it comes to actual books, Southern California is, I think the they sell more in Los Angeles. They sell more books in Los Angeles than you know many other metropolitan cities across the world. Of course, we are very proud of our book festival here, the LA Times Festival of Books. But I would be willing to bet that if anybody who attends the LA Times Festival of Books, and there's 150,000 people that attend that annually, if they had the opportunity to go to the Library of Congress Book Festival, they would have done it in a heartbeat. And how wonderful that PBS is providing that opportunity this year. And it's really, you know, talk about ingenuity, making sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to be a part of this in a time in which we're all feeling a little trapped. Now we can travel the world through the minds of these great authors through the, the wonderful cooperation between PBS and the Library of Congress and pbsbooks.org. And of course, all at uh, engaging our diverse uh, communities. We're looking forward to, Maria, your conversation uh, with Pam Munoz Ryan coming up, but first, let us take a look uh, at uh, a clip from the two-hour documentary. It is the 2020 National Book Festival Library of Congress celebrating American ingenuity hosted by Hoda Kotb. Let's take a look. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 20th Library of Congress National Book Festival. Hello, I'm Salman Rushdie. My name is Joy Harjo. I'm the 23rd U.S. Poet Laureate. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Reynolds. I am the current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. I'm extraordinarily excited to welcome Jenna Bushbaker to the National Book Festival. My name is Haben Gurma. I'm a disability rights advocate and author. Welcome, everyone. We're here with Madeleine Albright, the 64th Secretary of State. My name is Amy Tan, and I'm a novelist. I am Ann Patchett, and I am here with my friend Kate D. Camillo. Hi, I'm Sandra Cisneros. Hi, I'm John Grisham, here with the uh, National Book Festival. Books make us better human beings, better able to relate to one another, to think things through, and to take us to a better future. The theme of this festival is American ingenuity. And what exactly would you say, Colson, ingenuity is to you? Given what I've worked on for the last like six years, those two books, I would say it's uh, survival. People who never have to struggle or never have to work, they don't really have a lot of reasons to innovate or to fight their way out of something. That's the only thing we can count on in life is that there will be problems, that there will be pain. We have these enormous capabilities, and yet here we are sleepwalking, unable to awaken and to create the future that we need to create. What literature has always done is to give readers new ways of framing the world. And I think you can't function in the world today if you don't understand the history. History has to be spoken about as conversation because ultimately that's what it is. The great possibility of America is that we affirmatively decided that reason would be a guiding principle. You have to be free. Free is including as many imaginations as possible. Often, our best examples of creativity live in the in-between spaces. But it's the coping that's where the story is. I mean, the, the coping is the joy, and the joy is the journey. This year, in 2020, when we are in need for inspiration and a way for American ingenuity to lead us forward, these creative minds surely do remind us why the importance of memory, the need for reason, and the key to imagination are all rooted in words we find on the page. All coming up uh, October 15th at 5 p.m. on PBS SoCal or check your local listings uh, nationwide. All right, let's now bring in uh, our guest, Pam Munoz-Ryan, 
all uh, so much excitement uh, uh, building around uh, your appearance here. So glad that you are with us. Uh, of course, the recipient of the Newbery Honor Medal. We all know what that is on the cover of that book, the Kirkus Prize and the New York Times bestselling novel, Echo. We're going to talk about Manana Land. It's so great to have you, Pam. Uh, welcome to PBS Books. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to PBS and the National Book Festival and to my publisher, Scholastic. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful. And uh, let us also uh, welcome in uh, Marie Hall uh, Brown, who is going to uh, conduct the interview. But first, I would like to say thanks for connecting with us from PBS SoCal, the documentary airing on October 15th. Maria, it's all very exciting. And thanks for being here. Well, I, I cannot tell you, this is just a dream come true for me because uh, to be able to talk to somebody like Pam is remarkable to be able to share the interview with her, uh, you know, around the world like this. And to be able to celebrate books on PBS SoCal is uh, it's pretty special. So thanks, Fred. You got it. All right. Well, uh, Maria, the first question is yours. Well, good. I'm going to I'm going to ask a lot of them, that's for sure. Pam, thank you so much for being a part of this. And, you know, one of the things that kind of comes to mind that we're talking to each other virtually is that, you know, our world has changed so much. Uh, authors are you know, pretty solitary individuals when they sit down and do their work. But now we're all kind of trapped in this uh, this this pandemic land. Has it really changed your life much? And how are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm doing fine. Thank you. But um, I, I would say that your point is well taken is that my that that writers do lead a pretty solitary life, meaning that on a regular work day, we we don't have the camaraderie of of our peers. In other words, it's not like going into an office and having a staff room and other writers down the hall. Um, so most of my work is very solitary. What has changed a lot is um, the, the dichotomy of my job, which, you know, would vacillate back and forth from speaking engagements um, or speaking in academia um, or going on tour. Um, and to have a 2020 spring book, when COVID hit, um, that was dramatically different. Everything, you know, the world stood still. And, um, and I, it had been five years since Echo came out. So there was a big tour planned and, um, and you know, things got set by the wayside. And Publishers and publicists and um, all the event planners had to put their heads together and figure out a way that we could do this um, a different way. And here we are. And here we are. But, you know, it's a little uh, almost mystical, the fact that Manana Land at its core is all about dreaming of something better and keeping that hope alive. And the fact that it came out in this time, albeit difficult in terms of marketing and promotion, et cetera, is also you know, um, very poignant in that Manana Land is a journey of hope. True, true. Um, Manana Land is an, was an interesting, um, an interesting right for me because it's not set in a particular place. It's set in a, an obscure place somewhere in the Americas. Um, it's set in a time period that I don't really specify. And the reason for that is that this whole premise of, of guardians, of people protecting people who um, are marginalized and who need help, um, it is an ages old story. It happened generations ago. It's still happening now and it will probably continue to happen in the years to come. So it's a very broad overarching approach to a story. And it uh, centered around one boy in one village and, um, and his life experiences and the quest that he goes on. Well, and you know, you have a tendency in a lot of your books, you begin with whether it be family members or whether it be, it, you know, real life character, a real life, uh, people who have lived and, and fleshing out their story, et cetera. But this one, you, although it's not you, because there's a danger of always attributing right. an author's work specifically to themselves or everyone they know, but there is an element of this book that really comes from a personal place in right. your heart, looking to find somebody that was hidden from you. Right, that's true. Um, the story is based um, on a boy named Maximiliano, and he's 12 years old, and he is an aspiring professional soccer player, hopes to be someday because he comes from a long line of professional soccer players. And um, he also comes from a long line of bridge builders, um, um, literally and metaphorically bridge builders. And, um, and so when I had this 12-year-old boy, 
I had to ask myself what in his life um, could be so traumatic that would cause his entire world to to um, sort of disintegrate and create um, challenges for him. Um, no one in his town speaks about his mother. His mother disappeared when he was a baby. So um, his father doesn't talk about her. His grandfather doesn't talk about her. Nobody talks about her. And so I internalized that at asking myself, you know, when so often as writers uh, or aspiring writers, they try to look out to find all the answers. But uh, very often looking in and um, internalizing things and trying to find that those core feelings, um, sometimes you already carry those with you. And when I was writing his story, I realized that when I was 12 years old, my mom came to me one day and asked me if I'd ever rem if I remembered my biological father. Mm -hmm. And I did, but I didn't. It was never talked about in any circles. He was never talked about. Nothing bad, nothing good, nothing. And on top of that, I had a wonderful dad. I had a stepfather who was the best dad and who was caring and loving and nurturing and responsible. And so I didn't feel like there was a piece missing, but there was always sort of the, on the periphery, this knowing and not knowing. And as I grew older, there was also this feeling that I was in jeopardy, which but was never expounded upon by anybody. Um, so I, I inter internalized that and applied those feelings to my character, Max. Um, and um, so because for me, it was as, well, as 12 years old, I was trying to figure out where I fit into the world and, and he is doing the same thing. Right, so right. That's, that's how all that came about. Well, and it, it kind of makes a little bow because we're celebrating the anniversary of Esperanza Rising, which also came out of a personal family uh, story uh, about your grandmother. So it, it kind of all, it, it works in a very, very pretty way. Um, and congratulations on the anniversary of Esperanza Rising. Um, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's a joy to know that it has been uh, in print for 20 years and that it's still going strong and the story is still remains universal. Um, I'm very proud of it. I, some of my most poignant um, letters about Esperanza Rising come not necessarily from students, but from adults who, who've read the story and tell me that it's their family story, but maybe like one woman wrote to me and said, but my family's from India. And my father was wealthy in India, but when we came here, he could no longer get an engineering job. He ended up driving a cab for so many years, but he put all of us through school. So her, so the commonality in the story of um, the riches to rags story is, um, uh, and the immigrant story is, is I think the commonality in, in, in the story that has, in the glue that has, that has kept it, um, that has sustained it in print. So thank you. Thank you to all the readers and all the teachers and to my publisher for believing in it all those years ago. And it was a surprise somewhat that it was such an enormous hit. And now it's become part of curricula in schools everywhere. Yeah. Where you're saying that it was a little bit of a... Uh, I, you know, before it came out, um, like, you know, some years, I mean, all those years ago, we, we wondered, you know, um, first of all, they embraced it. They embraced the... the uh, the riches to regs, um, Mexican story, um, the immigration story, and no questions asked. It was always um, embraced by my publisher. But we wondered, would it be just a regional? Would it be a regional, have a regional appeal in the Southwest? Or, you know, would it um, transcend that? And fortunately, um, fortunately, or um, due to the wonderful hand selling of booksellers and the embracing the embracing from teachers, it's it's withstood the test of time. So thank you. It's an interesting thing. I was thinking about the opportunity yeah. to speak with you and um, the array of work that you've done from picture books, early readers, novels, et cetera, and then the focus on writing for youth and now having so many of your works part of, uh, you know, educational programs and curricula and being an integral part of a student's life. Do you ever think about that's kind of a heavy responsibility that you're, uh, you know, not just speaking to young people, but uh, formative young people who are going to hold on to what you write and carry it with them for their lives? 
Well, um, I, I think that for everyone in whatever work they do, I mean, they bring their, their own, um, you know, their own level of responsibility and obligation to their work. I, I, um, my biggest obligation to the reader is that I want the reader to turn the page. I loved reading so much and it was so formative. It helped form my life and it helped me cope during a time when I wasn't coping, especially during those fifth through ninth grade years. Um, and it was so important to me and I valued it so much that I think now it's no surprise to me that I write for the age I was when reading made the biggest difference in my life. But also I feel like I have this responsibility to my readers to help them, um, you know, get through uh, what, what, what books helped me get through, um, if that makes any sense. And really when I sit down to write, my biggest motivation is that, is that I want the reader to turn the page because I want to capture them. I love the idea of how books were such an important part of your life. I mean, growing up in an agricultural area in which it's quite warm. I mean, you said that you've you spent a lot of time in the library for you know a couple of reasons. A, it was cool with the air conditioning, but also because you were surrounded by all of this uh, magic of all of these books around you. I I just think that's a beautiful story and how important to have that uh, part of your life and that you always knew books were going to be a part of your life. Early on, I knew, I mean, as early as high school, I knew I wanted to have something, to, uh, a career that has had something to do with books. But curriculum was very different than um, the idea of becoming a writer really wasn't ever presented to me. Um, I didn't, I thought all writers were dead. Um, I, um, I didn't, um, you know, it was different. We didn't have, we didn't write across the curriculum like students do today. We didn't have young authors fairs. We didn't have authors visit our school. Um, we didn't have family literature nights. I think I would have loved, loved, loved all of those things. Um, but it was just, things were done differently. My school, my elementary school, I don't even know that it had a library. So, um, you know, when I discovered this tiny small branch library, library when, we, when my family moved across town and I was sort of the new kid um, in, in, on the block and in school, and I discovered this small branch library. It was just, I don't know, it was, it was just, it was a safe place. It was a place that I could say I was going that everybody accepted as, and nobody questioned. And, um, you know, it was an escape from many, many things, you know, younger sisters, younger cousins, the responsibilities at home. Um, and I was, I was captured. But you did write for your high school newspaper, did you not? Um, not my high school newspaper. I was <laughs> in um, middle school or junior high school. I was um, the editor of the um, of the the Washington Junior High um, <laughs> newspaper uh, back in the day when it was printed on a you know a mimeograph machine in, with purple ink. So <laughs> I'm sure that will date me. <laughs> No, I'm right there with you. Don't know um, the whole idea. You said that, you know, you always knew that books were going to be a part of your life, that whether you would work in a library or be a teacher, you were a teacher um, and also um, worked with young people in a, um, a preschool environment. But it wasn't until an actual teacher of yours said, you know what, you need to really think about this. And was that was there in Mrs. Professor Hughes, Dorothy? I'll think of her name in a second. At San Diego State University. Um, when she um, said that. Well, well I went back to school. I, I became a teacher. I thought that would keep me close to books. Um, I went back to, to school when my children were little. I wanted to do more. I wasn't, you know, I wanted to, I still wanted to be more a part of books. So I thought the answer to that would be to go back to school and get my master's degree I, and then even go on and become a, a pro, like a professor or teach children's literature. So when I finished my master's, um, Dr. Hughes, who um, she pulled me aside one day and asked me if I'd ever considered doing any professional writing. And until that moment in my life, I really hadn't. And I thought maybe she meant academic writing, oh, but she, she, she said no. And she encouraged me and she encouraged me to try. Um, I finished my master's, but she planted a seed that wouldn't stop growing. I couldn't stop thinking about writing my own manuscripts. And um, one thing led to another, very painfully slowly, I might add. Okay, and so 
I have to ask you because you actually wrote for adults before you wrote for children. What are food for thought books? Those were little, they like the type of things you would find in a Hallmark store, or they have little food for thought books about families and um, children and um, yeah, th those type of things. And then the transition to write for young adults and uh, children, just. It was just an, I, I began writing the children's stories immediately. Those were something that sort of came along of the way. And um, I did those because I was, in, I had gotten the writing bug. Uh, but from day one, I had started writing children's manuscripts. I love how you start an idea for a book. You are an incredibly curious person. I mean, all of your ideas, there's a wide array of uh, different subject matter, but it all comes from an arena of a question that you wanted answered. And then do you have, do you get like a tingle when you know that you've hit something that this is, this is what I can spend time with, and this is what I know I can share. And um, you know, well, um, people always want to know your process, right? Or they, yeah. want, or they want to know that moment that you that you know that your idea is right. And first, I have to tell you that for me, I mean, it's it's different for for many people. For me, um, for me, and and uh, the the culminating idea is a confluence of rivers. It isn't just one idea that just sort of sparks. Um, and very often the book that I set out to write isn't the one I end up writing or the one that demands to be written. Um, and so often I can be in the middle of research and I'll come across something and I'll think, oh, that's a great avenue, a great path to follow in the research and to see where it takes me. And it might take me to a dead end. But, um, you know, later I might find something else. And, it, and so so often it's, it's many things coming together that um, that bring an idea to fruition. And that happens through the research. And um, and my writing process isn't very tidy. It's a very messy evolution. So. And you rewrite 20 to 30 times, you've said. Oh, probably. I don't even know anymore because now with the computer, you don't print out every draft. Um, right. And so I'm I'm really not a writer. I'm a rewriter. I, I, I really never stop rewriting. I usually have the opening scene of the story in my mind. I start writing that scene. The next day, I go back to the beginning and I read and I rewrite and um, I continue writing. And the next day, I go back to the beginning. It's a very recursive process. I read and I write and I add more characters and and it's really constantly rewriting. And and you know, I tell students especially those early drafts are nothing more than something to fix and something to change and something to make better. And that really never stops. It continues throughout the whole story. And I continue going back to the beginning until it's a little bit um, burdensome to go that far back, but I'm always going three or four chapters back and trying to, you know, pull all of those threads before I start writing again. If that makes sense. Is Am I correct in saying that Manana Land actually, in your mind's eye, started as a picture book and then? Well, what happened was I had done, I had written The Dreamer with, and Peter, an illustrated novel. Uh, it was illustrated by Peter Cease. And he happened to be in New York and my editor and I met him for tea. And he happened to have a portfolio with him. And in the portfolio were these elaborate art pieces that, and sketches that he had done of Stone Arch Bridges from Prague, where he's from. And my editor and I talked about the possibility of Peter and I doing a picture book together, but we, we had no idea what that might be. Right. And right. as things happen, you know, we, we talked during that meeting um, and um, I began to see, I became very intrigued with the Stone Arch Bridges and I came home and started researching them. And I began seeing the scene of a, of a young boy and his father on the banks of a river near a Stone Arch Bridge. And I started researching how to build a Stone Arch Bridge and um, you know, and looking up ruins and bridges on rivers. And, and I got very, you know, intrigued with that whole process. And as it turned out, it never ended up, it, you know, the idea was that it might be a picture book, but it didn't really start out. I never really actually wrote a picture book manuscript because it became big much quicker than I realized. And then Peter moved on to do something else. And so um, we still hope to do a picture book together someday, but we'll see in the future. But that's how that all transpired is just this me becoming intrigued with these incredible sketches of stone arch bridges. And I love the metaphorical quality of, of bridges of one hand, you know, you know, one side holding hands with the other side of the river. And so then that, um, 
you know, that brought up more ideas. And, and so that's how that came about. The story behind it is really fun, I think, in a lot of ways. You know, when people ask your process and where you get your ideas and everything, but you really do have some great stories as to where you got your idea. You're reading the book of myths about, uh, um, it was called Myths, um, about uh, Amelia Earhart uh, taking Eleanor Roosevelt for a ride and just kind of pushing forward. And it turned out it was true. true. And, That's right. right. That. I mean, That's right. I was, you know, I mean, ideas come from so many places from, um, you know, and especially from reading, um, um, some, you know, you can, I, I can just be doing recreational reading and I'll come across something and I'll be curious about it and I'll start doing some research. And, and that's what happened with Amelia and, Amelia and Eleanor go for a ride about the night in 1933 when Amelia Earhart spent the night at the Roosevelt White House. And during the course of an elaborate dinner party, Amelia Earhart asked Eleanor Roosevelt what it was like to fly um, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt asked Amelia Earhart, what's it like to fly at night? Because at that time in history, very few people had flown at night, men or women. And right. then Amelia Earhart, being who she was, picked up the phone, called Eastern Air Transports, and within the hour, took the First Lady on her first night flight over Washington, D.C. at night. So, you know, that that just came about from me doing some recreational reading about, you know, famous women in America and finding out that the story was true. And sometimes research gets you on the back of a horse. It does. It has. It, it uh, th that was another way um, that that ideas come about. Is sometimes they are solicited. That was the case of my editor coming to me and saying, "Do you have any interest in writing a horse story?" You know, I was at an acquisitions meeting the other day, and um, we, you know, some of the senior editors were talking, and we'd love to have a, a really classic horse story. Are you interested in doing that? And at first, I, I was hesitant. I said, "Let me think about it," but I couldn't stop. It, it just, I couldn't stop dwelling on it. it. It pulled me back to being in fifth grade, riding my bike to that little tiny East Bakersfield branch library and full, filling my bike basket with books by Marguerite Henry. Dustin Morgan had a horse and Misty of Cinque Teague and all that. I spent a huge period of time of reading every horse book in that library. And so I, it, it, it was so nostalgic, the idea that I I called her back and said, yes, I'll do it. And what are the parameters? She goes, we have none. You can do anything. You can do anything you want, which um, in many ways was mu is much harder than having parameters. But I started reading books and got interested in wild horses in America and I knew that it's a culture and that I had to get everything right. So I started taking lessons. And after, you know, over 200 riding lessons and two research rides, one in which I slept in a teepee and, and uh, rode every day for for eight days to track a harem band of wild horses, I with a with a group with an outfitter, um, I wrote "Paint the Wind." Yeah. Did you feel right? I still found them. Yes. <laughs> See, it opened up a door that you Did walked you? through. That's that. Well, you know, I know that you're a Broadway musical fan, and I know that there has actually been a play version of Esperanza Rising, um, and I know people ask about movies all the time, but. Would you ever consider the idea of one of these books taking a life on stage with a musical background? I mean, you probably have a Look at the 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 play of Esperanza Rising that was commissioned by um, in Minneapolis was a musical, oh, and it oh. was spectacularly done with all equity actors and actresses. And it did tour. It was at the Goodman in Chicago, and it was at the Cutler in Boston, and it's been around the United States. And then. Um, so that that play has been performed, um, but of course, I mean every. I mean, I think everyone hopes and uh, or hopes and dreams um, is certainly not a contingency. But that 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 somebody will pick up your book and and want to do um, something on on the screen with it. And and there have been options, and there are options. So um, you know, I just have to keep hoping. So beloved, your characters, your books. Um... You know, children across the world love the book. But then along with that, you've gotten some pretty substantive accolades. So how does it feel that you you got a Newbery Medal? I mean, you've, you've been given some very prestigious um, and remarkable honors. Do you feel that? What is it like? Well, I, I mean, first of all, it's, it's really a validation it's a validation that you're, you know, to keep, and it's also a real pat on the back, an encouragement to keep going. And I think that, I mean, many writers, at least, I, at least for me, I think um, 
oftentimes you're always, you know, you're very insecure. You have, I, I have fear of the last duck syndrome and meaning that, that you have a lot of ducks in a row and you, you know, this fear that when the last duck goes off the edge, that there won't be any other, you know, projects or ducks lined up. And, um, and I think that, um, I mean, the accolades and the honors, um, it's just, it's so reaffirming and, and, and a reminder that you're on the right path and it's, you know, and it's as if somebody's saying, please keep going and please do do more. And so that's the lovely, the lovely thing about, about the accolades. I imagine your mail, email and notes you get are very emotional because, I mean, you even before we began this conversation, heard a story of how you've impacted, you know, one of the gals that we're working with today behind the scenes. So that must be, that, I mean, I imagine you hear stories that are really, really poignant and fulfilling knowing that you're making such a difference. Well, I think that's true. And sometimes you don't really know, the, you know, very often you don't know or hear the impact that you're making. And then on occasion you, you get a letter or, and it's, it's so touching. Um, I think the really the really interesting thing for me is that I've all the letters I re- receive from Latino children or Latino children, uh, teachers or, uh, or people or readers in general who tell me what the book of, of what Esperanza Rising meant to them or becoming Naomi Leon, even now Manana Land and, and Echo, the part where Ivy, uh, Ivy Maria's part, how much that meant to, to them. But even more important, I think, and more poignant to me sometimes are the letters I receive from the non-Latino children who tell me, like one boy wrote to me and he said, I liked learning about all the things that you said in in your book that I didn't know about, especially how things were during that time. You know, thank you for telling it to my eyes. And I think that very often the letters I get from children whose eyes that I have opened or whose, you know, perspectives that I've brought in, I think sometimes those letters are as poignant. And in an era in which there are so many diversions and there's so much chaos in a child's life to know that they are spending the time to sit and read those words and turn those pages, um, it seems to be an imperative as we move forward to, you know, to create those uh, ties between people so that we understand that, hey, I'm like you and you're like me. So I just think that, what is it? It was uh, William Nicholson wrote, we read to know we are not alone in his story about C.S. Lewis. It was attributed to C.S. Lewis, but it was actually William Nicholson that wrote that. And how wonderful that you have shared these stories with uh, these young people to know that they're not alone. Um, thank you. I, I think that that's what, as a writer, what you're looking for. You're looking for a story that, you, you know, that has threads of commonality and threads of feeling that, that many of your readers, you know, may feel or, you know, so, so that you can open um, a, a door of empathy for them. And um, so, like I said, we're not always, we don't, I don't always know if I'm successful, but I'm grateful when I am. <laughs> I seriously doubt you're going to run out of ducks, by the way. I, I have <laughs> well, thank you. in the backyard, <laughs> <That's very funny. laughs> duck after duck after duck after duck. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> well, uh, I, I really, really wish uh, that I have the opportunity to meet you uh, in person soon so that you can sign my version of Manana Land, which was uh, thank you. this beautiful um, read. And congratulations on Esperanza Rising and the celebration. And I just believe that you have made an enormous difference in so many lives. And it's such a thrill and an honor to actually have a chance to talk with you and share your story with people all over. And, and I'm very grateful to have met you. Thank you. I, I, I feel the same. And can I, can I make one last plug for libraries? Absolutely. Please do. So, um, you know, libraries in general are our most ecumenical and democratic and all-encompassing and uncensored and inclusive institution and um, that we have in America. And I discovered that the hard way, meaning that I presumed I was very ethnocentric about 
libraries. I thought that's how it was everywhere, that you could go to any country and go to libraries. But I've discovered when I travel around the world that that's not always the case, that in many countries, um, you have to belong to a library like you belong to a country club. Wow. And you have to pay to be a, a, a member of the library. And so that is a, a huge discrepancy between the haves and the have nots, the literate and the illiterate. So libraries equalize and um, libraries, the Library of Congress is, is the mothership of what our country represents. And I'm proud, um, I'm proud of that. And I'm proud to be part of the festival that celebrates at the very least our nation's attempt at literacy and making it available for all people. Maria Hall Brown, Pam Munoz Ryan, we'll let that be the final word to our great benefit to be able to listen into a terrific conversation. Oh. Ladies, I must say, the smell of that mimeograph is wafting. <laughs> uh, well. uh, great thanks to, to the two of you for being with us here on PBS Books. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. And you can see, uh, Maria. Uh, this interview will stay uh, online uh, on Facebook and on pbsocan.org. Uh, so uh, we look forward to continuing our uh, partnership there. And then um, uh, Pam Munoz Ryan, uh, her work will be featured on the uh, Library of Congress uh, website. So check that all out, loc.gov slash bookfest. The festival continues all culminating in the two hour documentary uh, airing on PBS SoCal, October 15th at 5 p.m. For all of us here at PBS Books, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.